Hi, I'm Dr. Brian David Phillips, and today I would like to talk to you a little bit about the hero's journey, or mythic structure, as it relates to film. When you watch movies, someone has written a screenplay for that film. Sometimes someone is a whole lot of people writing that or creating the story for it. And most major films today follow what's called the hero's journey model, uh, which is based upon the work of Joseph Campbell, who a comparative mythologist. Who essentially, he's, Campbell studied myth and legend and these old stories from ancient times. And he devised that many of these myths and legends follow a hero's journey model. There's a certain structure. Now, because we're talking about film, I'm going to be discussing the hero's journey in terms of uh, Christopher Vogler's approach to mythic structure, as it is most commonly used for screenwriters. But these stories, this model is used beyond film. That's just my interest for this piece, and I teach mythic structure analysis for my students at the university in my literature and film courses. Uh, but not only is film structured this way, myth is stu structured this way all over the planet. Those stories that last a really long time, they tend to follow this structure of 12 stages. And Actually, as Joseph Campbell very rightly pointed out, mythic structure, the hero's journey, also applies to personal psychology. Uh, many of us are living scripts, and the scripts we live by are myths. In fact, one of Campbell's texts that you might want to take a look at, Myths We Live By, looks at uh, how we can determine which myth we happen to be living by and how to change our script to a better one, if we happen to have one of those really nasty ones. But for our purposes right now, we're going to look at film adaptation of this. So I'd like you to think in terms of movies when I talk about the stages, rather than simply in psychological terms or mythological terms or literary terms. My PhD is in comparative literature, and so um, I tend to look at literature, but I love film, so I look at literature and film using mythic structure analysis, because one of my great loves is mythology and religious thinking. No kidding. All right, so the 12 stages, essentially uh, stage one is what we call the ordinary world, and that's where we, the hero is introduced in their ordinary world, going about their daily life, doing whatever they do. Before you can show, tell a story about a fish out of water, you got to show them in the water. You show them doing their normal life stuff. And then there's a call to adventure. And that call to adventure is, could be when a herald shows up and tells Beowulf, Dude, up north there's a monster killing the sheeples. Uh, or it could be some other thing that happens, uh, but it's a call where the hero is asked to enter into the adventure. But typically, stage three, the hero refuses the call or is reluctant to go. Uh, either, like Luke Skywalker, they don't want to leave uh, aunt, uh, aunt and uncle on the farm, got to do the chores, got to do stuff, uh, but something will happen, don't worry. Uh, stage four is called the mentor stage, and that's typically there's an older man or a person who gives advice, life advice to the hero. In the old stories, it's usually some old dude with uh, a beard. He's our Gandalf. He's our um, Merlin. He's our Dumbledore. Uh, but sometimes the mentor could be completely different. For instance, in Neil Simon's The Goodbye Girl, the mentor character is actually a little girl, the daughter of the main character. And the little girl is a wisecracker, and she gives all sorts of wisecracking advice to her mother about living her life. Uh, so the mentor can be physically present or even 
uh, absent as men memories that show up. Either way, there is a mentor character. Uh, typically, it's about this stage where the mentor is uh, introduced, but it doesn't have to be. The mentor can show up later. In fact, these 12 sta stages aren't always steps. Uh, mythic structure doesn't always follow this outline in a row. All right, so once we've got our mentor step, we've had our, our refusal of the call, and then something happens. Something happens, and we cross the first threshold. Crossing the threshold, the first threshold, uh, into the special world, into the adventure itself. Uh, sometimes it's very obvious, one of the greatest cinematic uh, fifth stages ever filmed, in my opinion, is The Wizard of Oz, Judy Garland, where you've got the black and white film and uh, the she's been the house has been picked up by the, the tornado, and it is a tornado, by the way. L. Frank Baum called them cyclones, and in the movie they call them cyclones, but they're tornadoes. I'm from Kansas, and we don't call them cyclones. We call them tornadoes. So our tornado house gets thrown down into Oz and we know we're in the special world when she opens the door and suddenly it's color. And that literally, first threshold, she crosses through a doorway into a special color world. Uh, other films it may not be quite so hitting you on the head with an iron pan, but it's still there. We cross into the adventure itself. Now, once we crossed into the adventure, then we have stage six. And stage six is tests, allies, and enemies. And that is, we've got a goal. Dorothy wants to get home. Luke wants to do his crap. Everybody's got to think about doing something. And notice in film, many times the initial goal changes or is diverted. In cinema, there's often what we call plot points, uh, which are moments where the story zigzags. So we zig, and then suddenly something happens and the story zags. One of the greatest uh, films, not greatest, but it's a good movie. Uh, it's an excellent example of plot points where they think they're doing one thing, and then they find out that what they thought they were doing is actually uh, not what needs to be done, so they start doing something else. And then they zag, zigzag, so there's a couple plot points in the film Sleepers, uh, which is a, a great example of that. But let's move on. We got Tess, uh, Dorothy. She's got to make it along the Yellow Brick Road. She's going to get make some allies, a Tin Man, the Lion, the Scarecrow. She's going to face obstacles, uh, the field of poppies, uh, getting apples. She's going to have tests and that sort of thing. All that stuff and the flying monkeys and the burning asses and all sorts of wonderful happy things. But that's, uh, this is actually stage six is often a very long section of the film itself. Most motion pictures are three acts. Some are five acts or fewer. Uh, so three, four, or five. Uh, very few films are two acts or one act. Uh, but typically, a three-act film, you're going to have about a fourth of the film is the first act. And then crossing that first threshold, that's when we get into act two. That's how we know we're into the meat of it. And that's about half the movie is the second act. And then the final third of the movie is the third act. And we've got plot points in there to really let us know where the stage points are. But we go through the ally building, we make some enemies, and we have some tests, and uh, ideally we pass them. It is the hero's journey. And so we go through all that, and then we have the next stage is stage seven, which is called the approach to the inmost cave. Now, the inmost cave, you know, hell, that hole in the ground, Ulysses got to go to hell. Uh, the approach to the inmost cave is, is where we... Um, prepare ourselves for to face the big baddie, the boss of the video game, or the evil, the great evil that we must face. Often it is our greatest fears are encapsulated within this 
big bad character. The approach to the inmost cave is that period where we face our psychological traumas, we build up skill sets so that we prepare ourselves for this. And as we journey underground, then we have, boom, stage eight, the supreme ordeal where we do face the big bad guy, where we do face our greatest fears. Indy's gotten himself uh, in a room full of snakes. Snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? And so you deal with that supreme ordeal. This is where we know it's a hero who, despite the fears, continues forward. Whereas someone who is not a hero, because of the fears, they fuck off. They don't go forward. So... Supreme Ordeal. Once you've got your Supreme Ordeal, you've made it past the big baddie, you seize the sword, or you take possession of the reward. And that could be the princess. Yay! Yes, she's a reward. Remember these are based on really old stories. Or the sword, the magic sword, or the elixir. Uh, so you've got the reward, you take possession of it, and then we have the road back. That once see once you've got your goal, the story's not done. No 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 no. Bad guys are gonna chase your butt. You're gonna go on the road back, and that's actually the transitionary period as well. From the special world, you have to acclimate yourself to these new experiences you've had uh, back into your ordinary world. And that's our our road back under pursuit and sometimes people lose themselves psychologically in this stage and so it's very important and then we have another threshold the third threshold of uh, the the peace uh, and that is you know so we, we had our first threshold you've got the inmost cave supreme ordeal and then we've got what's called the third threshold which is the resurrection now the character will die or face death and certain doom and something happens. Uh, in the film and novel, The Princess Bride, a brilliant piece by William Goldman, a great example of this is of course the scene, uh, well of course, that uh, Wesley is actually dead and resurrected. So there is that, he's given a resurrection pill, but the best scene, one of the greatest film scenes of the resurrection is the duel between Inigo Montoya and the six-fingered man. Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father, prepared to die. Inigo is obviously defeated by the six-fingered man who has thrown a specially constructed dagger. And so his guts are falling out. He's got to put his fist in a hole in his gut where his guts are coming out, he's against the wall, he's slumping down, and the six-fingered man, the dick count, taunts him. Oh, you are the brat Spanish boy who I slid when I was a little boy. It's so funny that you lived all your life for revenge, and now you will die. <laughs> and then Inigo's like, oh. Hello, my name is Nigo Montoya. You killed my father, prepare to die. Hello, my name is Nigo Montoya. You killed my father, prepare to die. And he starts carving the guy up. Uh, it's an awesome scene. Go see the movie. Even better, read the book. I had the original first edition, red letter edition, which is actually very awesome. I recommend it high, highly. Uh, it's one of, but it's one of my favorite books. So there you go. Uh, but the resurrection, the character who is, seems to be defeated, comes back to life and, and does whatever they need to do. And finally, after all that, we have a return with the elixir. And that is when the character, the hero, returns to the ordinary world a changed person. With the elixir, that's the alchemical solution that transforms them. Now, a hero as we see some from so many stories, is set apart from others. They're no longer an ordinary person. Uh, they become an outsider who protects normality, the ordinary world, but they have done so, the, the great sacrifice for all of us, just like in real myths, etc. All right, and that's uh, the 12 stages of the 
hero's journey or a mythic structure uh, model for film or stories or psychology or just life. Either way, this has been Dr. Brian Diffie Phillips. I hope you've enjoyed yourself. Click on subscribe and all those goodies and above all else, live trends and prosper. Bye-bye.